them to um, to sort out the air condition. Well, thank you. So you're one of my new partners. Yeah, it was announced earlier oh, today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let me just put on this. Okay, our um, next speaker is um, Chris Hodgson. Um, before going to introduce Chris, um, after lunch we've got Chris and Mike as our expert panel here. If you um, um, would like to come up with your um, specific questions about your specific companies, that would be great, then we can discuss. Uh, we had another member of panel, unfortunately, as I said, uh, she can't be here. So, um, um, with, with that introduction, Chris is a partner at uh, CMP. Oh, sorry. No, that's, that's Ryan one. Yeah. It's not. Sorry. Uh, let's just get rid of this, otherwise it's... I can do an intro in the future. Yeah, I'm sorry. okay. <laughs> um, Chris, um, presentation will um, be around uh, CISOs, uh, Chief Information Security Officers, uh, in, in, in respect to GDPR. So, um, I hope you enjoy his presentation. And I'll, um, thank you. Thank you. Um, copy and paste. That's oh, right. Okay, let's stop the clip of the stick. Ah, uh, looks better. Perfect. Is it? The right one? Yeah. Thanks, Rosa. Yeah, right, quick. Thank you everyone. Um, I'll start this by saying I'm not a lawyer, um, so it might be a slightly different talk that we're going to do here. Um, before I start, does everyone know who Zscaler is? I'm going to dip in and out, I'll end up saying Zscaler, sorry. Um, does anyone know who we are? Does anyone know what we do? Okay, a couple of people, okay. So, um, I was raising my hand in some, some kind of um, sort of contribution earlier, but technically speaking, we're a service provider. I think in a lot of cases, we act, in, in sounds parlance, we act as a data processor for lots of organisations. We're essentially a cloud-based security provider. So what we look to do is, historically where an organisation would have a series of kind of appliances in their data centre, which have taken those, put them in the cloud. So we have about 15 million users, we see about 45 billion transactions roughly a day. So within that we have a fair bit of personal information. So I thought I'd come here today it's kind of a little bit of a clickbaity title, 80% of GDPR is outside of the CISO's control. And I'll come on to what that's about in a moment. But given that we couldn't um, actually do my background or bio, um, I moved into the vendor world about oh wow, that is chilling. I moved into the vendor world about two years ago. Prior to that I had 16 years experience in end user organisations, working as kind of an architect, head of function, engineer. So I've seen a lot of challenges around privacy, a lot of general challenges around cyber security. Some of the principles we've spoken about today, so things like privacy or data protection by design, it's one thing having principles, it's another thing actually tracing that through to implementation. So I'm going to talk about a number of those challenges, and I'm going to talk largely from the cyber security side of things rather than the legal and contractual side of things. So why am I here? Well, I wrote a piece on um, GDPR on LinkedIn about, I think about eight months ago. I was over in um, RHQ in San Jose. I do an awful lot of work with the media, sort of public speaking, writing. And I was brainstorming with our PR team. And we were looking at different areas around polymorphic malware, looking at SIM integration, nothing to do with GDPR. But I happened to be our data protection officer. We decided that we were establishing a data protection officer for a number of the reasons that I spoke about earlier, the volume of information, the fact that we're primarily a US organisation, and lots of other reasons that we can discuss at lunch during the panel. So I was there trying to do my kind of PR activity and look at these different ideas. We kept coming up, people kept phoning me around GDPR. In a rather stressed moment, I came up with the idea that, well, most of this is actually outside my control anyway. We need to go and talk to this area of the business around data mapping. We need to understand to Sam's talk around contracts that we have up and downstream. Kind of this title kind of came out of it, which was you know 80% of 
GDPR is outside of the CISO's control. It's got a well received piece online. Um, check it out on my LinkedIn page. That's one of the reasons that I'm here. And another one, um, the primary part of my role really is I speak to CISOs, CIOs pretty much every day. Pretty much what I do. Go and understand what their business is doing. Look at priorities. And that gives me kind of, I suppose, quite a broad view of different organisations, their preparedness for GDPR. And on my side of things, as a CISO, also interpretations of things like state of the art security, data protection by design. They're very, is it um, They're very good, and you know, no one would disagree with them in principle. But how do you materialise a set of controls from, dare I say, what is quite a nebulous set of statements potentially? So it's another reason that I'm here. Um, and yeah, it's good feedback on the talk. And I told Reza that I'd, I'd come and do it for free. So you've got me for probably the next half an hour or so. Um, this was an interesting stat that I found. And again, we all love the Gartner stats and the horizon views and hype cycles and all the likes. But it certainly resonated with me and in my conversations that I have with DPOs, different CISOs. I'm interested in what the other speakers here today, maybe we can do it during the panel, kind of their experiences of organisations. And the reason I thought this was interesting, you know, I don't actually know that many organisations who are this candid about their GDPR assessment. You know, organisations understand that they have work to do, but to actually come out and say by the end of 2018, over 50% of organisations will not fully fulfil the requirements, it's quite a bold assertion on Gartner's side. Um, my assertion associated with that, I think it's because we don't have case law in this space. And again, I'll leave this to the, to the lawyers in the room, but I talked about PCI DSS a moment ago and HIPAA and all these different kind of control framework orientated compliance regulations. You kind of know where you are with them. You either have encryption on something or you don't. You have AV on something or you don't. And you can kind of assess a compliance posture. I think a lot of this kind of stems from organisations not always knowing what they need to do. We'll, we'll come back to that in a moment. So. The way that we've looked at this, and I want to do a little bit about how we're approaching GDPR in my organisation, because I mentioned there that we see about 45 billion transactions a day. We also have our requirements as a data controller as well. So kind of split our GDPR programme into a number of phases. We have a vertical for our controller requirements, so looking at our own employees, looking at our financial information. Very recently became a public company, there's lots of scrutiny around that side of it. But then also having a separate task force that's actually looking at processing. Processing of information on a customer's behalf, essentially. And I've been listening to the conversations around things like 72 hour reporting windows, around allocation and identification of sub-processes. And then maybe that's something we can cover in the panel because I see a real variation in that sub-process or identification of what organizations are actually putting in their data processing agreements. Some, again, very granular on that in my opinion, giving everything from every software off-the-shelf application they're using through to every IaaS solution, whereas others, um, let's say they're not necessarily being as clear. But also another point I think that's important is organisations for me, most organisations I'm speaking to, almost have a left and a right GDPR programme. I think it's very, I not say it's easy, but if you think from a greenfield perspective, looking at your requirements around mapping of data flows, looking at the security of processing, Article 32, privacy, data protection by design, those principles, if you've got a new project, I would say that they're reasonably straightforward to embed into the project life cycle. You can put them into your requirements gathering, you can put them into your high-level design, mid-level design, boom, you deliver a solution. Well, you're a retail organisation, let's say a retail banking organisation, 30-year-old um, AS400 system that's sat there that's been harvesting for genuinely legitimate reasons, bank account information, dates of birth, address, etc., etc. You know, these systems are predating requirements around data protection and privacy by design. And I think, and it's a shame we can't have the ICO conversation, so I made a few notes. Um, what organisations do in that space, for some of the more <coughs> pragmatic sort of CISOs and DPOs that I've seen, are saying, we have two GDPR projects. We have the risk analysis, activity around the stuff we know categorically we just can't fix. And then GDPR talks extensively around this being a risk-based approach, so they're spending an awful lot of time analysing, kind of compensating and mitigating controls in that space. 
and kind of this forward-looking project, which is much more around solutions architecture, much more around policy augmentation, and having that information included. And at some point, these two projects need to need to come together. But certainly, I think that's quite a pragmatic approach. A risk-based analysis of stuff you definitely know you can't fix, and then obviously embedding these controls moving forward. And that kind of, I suppose, a requirement for that is data privacy impact assessment. And we spoke <coughs> earlier around doing that for high-risk information. The approach that I've taken, that, that feels a little bit cart for horse for me. I, 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 if you look at the requirements of a DPIA, I don't think you can answer some of them until you've done a DPIA. So what we're trying to do in my organisation is kind of say anything that we're looking at that could potentially be processing personal information to run through at least a light touch data protection analysis in that phase. Allow us to make the call on if it processes personal information. I think if we put that back to, in our case, product management, engineers, developers, and allow them to make that call on is something personal information or do we contain information that is um, highly material to a person, causes us some problems. And I think another point that's important here is having this kind of cross-functional, I'll come on to it in a moment, this cross-functional engagement around your data protection programs. So again, if you don't mind, kind of a show of hands on how many, I suppose, people in the room in your organisations have that cross-functional working in your data privacy program? You know, uh, is it exclusively driven from legal or even worse, IT? <laughs> well, 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 no, you know, joking aside, I, I speak to a lot of organisations who still see that this is a, an IT problem. They still turn around and, you know, it's been lumbered on the CISO or the director of IT who says, right, GDPR compliance, invariably our information is on lots of boxes with flashing lights, although you're responsible for it. And I've put a few of the teams on there that are kind of, I suppose, key stakeholders in my program, and I'll, I'll touch on why on, on each of them. So legal, again, Sam's talk covered quite a lot of that around security addendums, around data protection, assessments, around changing contracts. Again, working for an organisation with so 3,000 customers and 15 million users, a lot of those in Germany, a lot of those in different areas where you know, data protection, GDPR or otherwise is incredibly important to them. We have to have legal involved in this program. Marketing, we are a vendor. We do lots of marketing stuff. Marketing people like to keep information forever, just in case there's the off chance that they may need to use it. Um, they have some kind of contentious understandings of what least privilege is, in my experience. And again, I'm interested in the views of others, but I also think the challenge is they want this frictionless experience of, of gathering information. So if we're making people explicitly opt in, if we're requiring having lots of different forms for consent, double click opt ins, for example, they're generally quite opposed to that unless there's this kind of education and awareness activity. So I spent quite a lot of, yes, yeah, sorry, I just wanted to add because you asked. I mean, in organisations that I advise are larger, like housing bodies, local, you always get the boards involved from the very top. Mm -hmm. Because the problem with the DPA, and the reason why we've got this problem first, is because it has, there hasn't been ownership from the top. Mm -hmm. And any training course, for example, as, as, as you mentioned, there's been a tendency to just focus on the IT department, yeah. which is where the problem is. I mean, even with this big thing in the States now, we've got lots of uh, politicians quest quizzing about the technical issue they don't understand. It. Absolutely. Our approach is to, and I see almost like, you know, a, you know, the essential thing, you have to go from the top. You have to have someone on the board who is like the DPA, uh, the data person, the data protection sort of privacy champion, mm -hmm. just like you'd have a chief financial officer on the board, you know, you've got to have someone from that level who takes responsibility right down, mm -hmm. because it shows the whole organisation that this is serious. Yeah. And uh, I'd say, and that's what, you know, if, if I think if this comes in, then that quote that you put up mm -hmm. will become a reality. That yeah. only, that there will be very few compliances, mm -hmm. because we'll be slipping back into, I, I see what you said. No, I agree. But, but, but that, for me, and again, we'll come on to come on yeah. to this in a moment. I think if you look at things like, and again, I'll focus from a cyber perspective because we hear, and Elisa, we hear this rhetoric. It's not rhetoric. We hear this view that you know security is a board level 
consideration and cybersecurity is in the top three risks of Lloyd's London and blah 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 and, and that's all true but it's a real, for me anyway, it's a real balancing act between getting board visibility of things that they care about and articulating risk in a way that doesn't just get you one seat at the board table for one meeting and Chris Hodgson's never invited back again because all he does is talk to us about malware alerts and, and I think the danger with GDPR and this whole kind of top down, of course you need a top down view of privacy but he's articulating it in such a way, and I actually sort of disagree a bit with the Nigel around going in and saying you're going to get fined 4% of your global turnover because you just you get this kind of apathy in a way, I think, of board execs who've heard this for two years now without substantiating really the specifics. So that's, that's been my challenge. Well, if we don't, because yes, you may get fined 4% for certain principles and articles that you breach, and probably know better than I do. But I've used that strategy in the past yeah. when, because I'm on the DPA. It was very hard to engage boards. Yeah, of course. So you had to use the front mm -hmm. So it's been very. I, I think it's sad that you have to. <laughs> you know, I mean, but it's yeah. in reality it does work. It, 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 but I think it, it should it can be, it can be used up a lot certain, more than that now. Yeah, it can be used in certain situations. Yes, I think if yeah. moving forward, if you're trying to engage and empower people within your business, and you're you're only kind of I suppose it's like a boxer, isn't it? If you've only got one punch, you're you're not in a good position. I think if we tell them everything is a four percent fine under GDPR. We're going to lose attention when after 12 months. It's the problem with applying security controls, isn't it? How do you prove a negative? If you haven't been breached, how do you go back in year two and ask for another five million for security budget? It's, it's an incredibly hard situation. But I agree, you do need top down engagement. I mean, we do a lot of training, right? I mean, I mean I've trained boards, etc. What happens is, I mean, people, once people see that this is a personal issue, this could be my data as well, because in a lot of organisations, you can get challenges from within as well as without. And so it becomes, if you, it, it depends on how you present it. Um, if you show that it's, you know, it's, it's a risk from within and without, and people, because some people only think of it as a risk from without. Yeah. And some of the challenge, biggest challenges I've seen are from within. Absolutely. Um, okay. Um, this is an approach. <laughs> It's an approach I'm using, an approach I'm trying to use in my organisation at the moment around cross-functional data privacy work. And it's for the reasons that I've highlighted on the previous slide. I think trying to have somebody who's in a vertical at the moment, so someone who's sat in IT, somebody who's sat in marketing, somebody who's sat in finance, somebody who's sat in sales operations, and having them not taken out of those functions and working, like I said, cross-functionally with this <coughs> tiger team, that's the approach that we've taken to this because, you know, in a lot of organisations, they're not as prepared for GDPR as they'd like to be. I think if Sam was in the room, I didn't want to read his talk, but he talked around kind of the processes for talking to vendors and third parties and what you do from a contracts perspective. You know, you're going to have to move very quickly on a lot of these things because a lot of the responses you're going to get back from third parties is, we'll get back to you in six weeks. You know, that, that is one, that's what I've had from some fairly large American platform as a service providers who, anyway, you can work out who they are. You know, you will get told, you know, this is going to take a long time. And I think having people ready to move on things very quickly, having the ability to kind of assimilate information within your own business is incredibly important. I think when we talk about things like data mapping exercises, when we talk about kind of principle five and lawful purpose of having information, that's not something that an IT department feels. Okay, in very few cases, that's not something that an IT department can fix. Around why you need to retain information, the period of time you need to retain information for. I, as a CISO, to my kind of idea of the talk of saying I'm only in control of 20% of this, I can't really help with that. So having this cross-functional collaboration, having a team taken out of their day-to-day -day jobs who are working as kind of this agile, almost privacy function, with very small work packages, again, that's my awful attempt at the Kanban board, some things that we're working on or we're working on quite a, a long time ago and giving everybody a voice so this isn't as i said earlier this isn't something that's being delivered from it this isn't something that's been delivered from legal to, to your point a moment ago this is something that's important to your business it's important to i suppose differentiate certainly some of the things that we've been using as a vendor when i go and proactively talk to my customers when i go and talk to other dpos we sit there and say look you've already produced these dpas you have these security addendums it builds value, it builds trust, so it's, it's, it can be useful. I was being recorded, I'm going to use GDPR as a, as a revenue stream, but certainly giving assurance and quality to your customers is always important. 
Um, these are some of the key things that I'm working on at the moment. And again, as you can see here, security is one of the key components. But I say this in a lot of my talks and, and some books and stuff is, you know, we're there to design controls, commensurate classification of information. Now that's not a GDPR phrase, that's just, in my opinion, good info set guidance. So right? you tell a security function what is important, personal or otherwise, tell me something's highly confidential, tell me something's internal. I will design a set of controls appropriate with that. But guys, come on, I need you to tell me what's important. And to the chat at the back, we want some personal information and e-discovery from earlier. You know, understanding the context of each individual situation, understanding when an IP address could potentially be considered personal. And I do believe in a fair few scenarios it could be considered personal. Understanding how that application works, understanding why you have that information and other areas that that information comes into contact with. You know, technical security only gets you so far there. The point around communicating with business, I think we've covered it, and I do agree that should be a top-down initiative. Um, data flows. Now, this is why I think the DPIA is a little bit cut before us, because I find that those data flows actually come out of the DPIA. I mean, if I'm sat down in my business areas, and maybe I have a unique situation in that we develop a, a set of platforms, a set of products, sitting down and mapping out those data flows as part of the DPIA is useful. It's a, it's a phase two activity of it, but we're doing that where if something doesn't end up having personal information, we wouldn't go down that route, but we would have it as part of the same activity, otherwise it's, it's not particularly time efficient to do so. And analysis of data retention. This can kill you on email, in my experience. You know, when we talked about that cross-functional team, it's one of the reasons we've got it, because the, I can't remember the exact wording in the specific article of recital, but keeping information for as long as you need it for legitimate business purpose, that varies across several different business units, across other laws that you may have to comply with, across other regulations. And if you haven't got a set of people and one representative from each of those associated areas, it becomes an overly onerous and time consuming activity. Um, data breach response. So these were a series of kind of questions that I teed up internally and, and unfortunately I should say the answer to these is, is, is yes when we were doing this. But this, if you're not going to do a full blown DPIA in all scenarios, from a CISO's perspective, I find these are a really good set of questions to be asking the different areas of not only your team but also the wider business. So can we identify all the data types? So I'm looking at this from a, from a technical perspective here. Can we identify all repositories? Because invariably when you talk to a business stakeholder who might work in finance, for example, they might know that they use a single platform. But that's about the level of you know, compartmentalization they'll go into with that, understanding all those repositories. And again, cloud is a massive player in this. <coughs> Times have changed. You know, information is being stored in AWS, it is in Azure, it is in Salesforce, it is in these third-party SaaS providers, which again muddies the waters because your levels of assurance and control that you may apply to a SaaS provider, you can still obtain that level of assurance, but you're not getting it by the means that potentially you would if you went and saw Dave in the development team and sat down every time. So that's got to be kept in view. We talked extensively around supplier relationships, um, and also who do we need to notify? I think mean, everyone knows they need to notify their supervisory advisor, and that's kind of your GDPR side of things, tip for material breaches and another term, I don't know what it means, but a material breach. But who else in the wider good practice side of things should you be letting know? Yes? I've got, I see you've got a line there, can we detect a breach? Do you believe you have an obligation to put the systems in place that would enable you to detect a breach before the FBI turns up? Uh, that's, I mean, yeah, 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 in America, that's the common scenario. Yeah, it, it is. Yeah, what you don't want, and what happens in, in more cases than you would you would imagine, is the first time someone knows that they've had a breach is, is yes, they yes, the door, door yeah. and someone says, "Excuse me." Uh, yes, but it, but again, it's actually two slides or three slides time around this whole that's right, this whole piece around notification. Because when I first looked at this seventy-two hour reporting window. Real shame, something. So, throughout reporting window of what you needed to do in that time frame, my understanding was it was phone up, in my case, the ICO and said, oh, yeah, we think we've lost information. Not too sure, but we're looking into it. 
my understanding, and I may be wrong, I, I think that the, uh, the commissioner has actually said this is, we're it expecting... The DPO. Yeah, we're expecting... I mean, I'm amazed that it's it should be the DPO, because uh, that's a whole idea of having a DPO or part of it anyway. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, but no, but the external, I think we're talking about yeah. the external yeah. communication. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah. In terms of, I, I, I mean, I'd expect the DPO to have got involved at the moment that there is any breach, but um, yes, ought to be have their fingers on the pulse of that, mm -hmm. especially um, assuming it is an organisation which requires uh, compulsory. Yeah, but I think the question is that you get an indication yeah. of the Right. So if you can see to my OCs, I've been breached. But before you know what the breach actually entails. See that? See that? And that's, yeah, and see that's that's the point. So yes, I agree. Yeah. Completely but your DPO should be sufficiently trained mm -hmm. to be able to help you on that. You see, the problem is again, we're thinking of the old Data Protection Act, and but we're moving into the GDPR. The idea is, although we might not get there at the beginning, but that's where it's leading. That your DPO should be properly qualified. The problem is they haven't specified what properly qualified means in the thing after yep. making such a big fuss about it. No, I agree. So, so what if you can just have a DPA? <laughs> well if it doesn't and it should, then it's in trouble. But yeah. what if he what if it doesn't and it doesn't have a legal requirement to need one? Well I, I from my understanding of it is that they're still expected to use good common guidance sense, you know, I mean, because I mean, we get this problem with charities, for example, yeah. as, as the point you're trying to make it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So this, this is about reporting, isn't it? This is the crucial bit. It's what my, my understanding, and this is this something that's come out of many, many bits of the process, conference processes over over the last um, 10 months or so, is that provided you have been in contact with the ICO and you have alerted the fact that you believe there has been a breach and you are investigating it, then that is adequate. Um, the real question is, it's 72 hours after becoming aware of the breach. My question has always been, what is deemed as being aware of the breach? Because the person, perhaps a junior operative or somebody who has created the breach, for all sorts of the right reasons, may not want to whistleblow the fact that they just had this yeah. issue. You may not know about it until a complaint comes in from the outside. That clearly is the point at which the business says, right, we need That's to act now. Point. But the time of technically should yeah. start at the point at which the operative yeah. breach dates and whenever that happens yeah. to be. So there's a, there's a whole bunch of... I, I, of I agree. That, that, yeah, I don't want to get semantic again. But to, to, I'll answer that, and I think it will answer that. So mm -hmm. your point around an IOC, for example, if you take kind of a common, I mean, it's a few slides of time, but a common risk equation, of threat actor initiates threat event which exploits vulnerability which causes business impact. Mm -hmm. You're talking about the business impact as being your kind of marker of why that's when we've been notified. The challenge of doing it from an IOC perspective is that indicator of compromise could be associated with something which might pertain to a data breach, <coughs> but in your point, it could also be a complete false alarm or something that's mitigated with these state-of-the-art controls that we're supposed to have. That, 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 that sorry, but that, that's, that's my challenge there. So I think you're right, I think it is when you have being, and you are you are clear that it is actually a breach rather than we have had a DDoS attack on the external interface of something that has manifested itself in nothing. But having the plan, and yes, of course, if you have a DPO, that DPO should be versed in this framework. They should be coordinating this team. I don't think it's the DPO's responsibility to be assessing necessarily if something is a breach when it's a situation like that. If it's not the CISO and it's not the security function. I think you do need your head of security ops, you do need your head of cyber, you do need your legal team, you need your PR team involved. Does that answer? But does it seem does it seem like if it's a major breach mm. and, it, and if you don't know that you're actually being reaching other parts of the legislation, that's the problem. Yeah, actually, it's it's actually it's actually it's also nice. comes back to what 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 is what is a breach? And I yeah. think the breaches can be as simple and straightforward, arguably, as one of our technicians only looking at somebody's medical records when they're dealing with somebody's PC in a, in a doctor's practice. Yeah. And that's a breach. It's a major one. Yeah. 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 Has that caused somebody some distress? Yeah. Well, last night we were at a similar exercise to this uh, with a good people at BT in Kent. Um, and and uh, just mentioned very, very simplistically, we were talking about the fact that in smaller organisations where we have lots of controls, we have lots of education for our staff, that, that's great, it's simple and straightforward. Mm -hmm. But take something, somebody like the Royal Mail, for example, and this is an extreme example, so, so bear with me. But you're a post lady, 
and she popped somebody's letter through the wrong letter yeah. box, and it's very, it's open in, in error, and it's very clearly about a medical circumstance, perhaps some cancer treatments, or whatever. You've had a really fundamental breach there. Somebody's now been made aware, they may be very upset about that. At what point is the breach determined to have happened? How is it dealt with? Yeah. When is it recorded, etc. etc.? cetera? And it raises all sorts of spectres about, you know, how simple error uh, 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 and yeah. so on can well, cascade yeah. from there. I wonder if that is what I do think is the DPO's responsibility yeah. to ascertain that. See, I'm, I'm sorry to keep banging on about it, but that's... And I think you're right by saying the approach should be holistic. But that, that's the whole idea. I think I, the sympathies come for organisations that don't have such. I mean, I think the bigger organisations should be sufficiently robust and they've got enough notice. I mean, they've had to think for, for two years before you see who the get everyone's crying, you know, oh, this is terrible, it's all coming up on us now. But I think if, if the organisation wants to get around this, then they, they should really have some kind of procedure which says what you do in the event. And there's the issue of near misses as well. Mm -hmm. What about near misses? That's not a bridge. But under the old system, we had to do the initial so. It's just like the what the two gentlemen have said and asked your point as well, Chris. In terms of the reporting on a breach, is it equally weighted now, like the gentleman said, in terms of civil and criminal? Because technically speaking, if you didn't report it to the police, so you could technically be done for obstructing or whatever, do you know what I mean? I'm not sure you could. I, 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 know, I know what you're saying. I'll, 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 I'll,
How am I doing? Is it time? No, that's fine. I'm doing time. Yeah. Cool. Okay. The, this was a, a slide. I'd love to say I did this. My marketing team did this one for, for something different. Um, around the, the gentleman's point at the back around the e-discovery the piece earlier. Uh, the reason why I think things like that are incredibly problematic is, you know, it, it depends. Personal information could be everything from my shoe size through to an IP address, through to a digital certificate that I'm using for TLS interception. I mean, it, it's as broad as that. So if you're not doing the DPIA, and I sound like a broken record, but if you're not doing the DPIA, I don't know how you can assess contextually if this is important. So again, my advice for anyone who cares is there has to be some form of privacy impact assessment, data protection assessment that you're doing because IP address, for example, can be lots of different things. And again, Article 9 data, and I know Nigel talked about it earlier, around things like biometrics, sexual health information, yes, that has to be treated differently, but there's so much now that can be considered personal information. And again, if you work with US colleagues, you work for a US organization, <coughs> personally identifiable information, PII, under, for example, HIPAA, so healthcare regulation, it's very different, it's a lot more narrow, than what, narrow, it's probably the word I was looking for, than, than what we're looking for under GDPR. I'm not going to talk about this, we've, we've kind of done this to death. I do think though as a data processor, you should have it explicitly in your contracts how you're dealing with the 72 hour reporting window with your data controllers. Because again, I think the right bit at the moment is implied, but we'll get back to you when we can. Having that a little bit more firmed up is, is a good idea. This is, this is nice. I put this together because I'm going to show you a, a network architecture of Fortune 50 Thing. Let me just check, I'm not in my notes if you're sending this out. No. Um, Fortune 50 customers before they became um, one of our customers. This is their journey from a user going to the internet through their DMZ. So I think this is 28 hops. So, and this was just because people like me have said, no, you must have an antivirus solution, you must have DLP, you must have a sandbox, you must have a web proxy. You end up with something that looks not dissimilar to this in most large organisations. So the point around what you report, when you report, and 72 hours, I think, quote unquote, being reasonable, I challenge that. I think to actually gather the telemetry, and yes, people use things like SIM platforms, but to gather some level of intelligence, some level of information from what is a load <coughs> of data is incredibly challenging. So that's, that's one area that I'm interested in post-May is actually getting this information in a meaningful fashion, a normalised fashion that you can then use forensically. Because I'm quite sure, and I'm, sure not here, I'm quite sure the ICO don't want me to just send them syslogs of, of all of these and say, you know, crack on. So that's, that's going to be a tactic. I thought that was quite interesting because that's a very slow, very expensive um, method of applying security as well. Right, here we go. Um, risk frameworks. So this is something, so I've done a lot of work, I wrote a uh, thesis on um, demystifying risks of public cloud a while back and reasonably well received and risk is something I've stayed quite close to um, and it's key for GDPR. Now, what I'm trying to advise my internal teams and when I'm having conversations with, with DPOs and CISOs is if you're not going to comply, so we're looking at our 30 year old AS400 system for example that can't implement privacy by design, you can't have field level encryption for whatever reason. Having this repeatable risk framework that evidences, I suppose, the classification of information, information around where that data resides, any compensating controls or mitigations, and also a timeline for remediation. Something I find completely unacceptable is to say, this is really bad, we're not going to comply, and sort of walking away. I think you have to evidence some form of remediation, even if that is going to be 12, 24 months, having that framework. Ones that I like, um, again, using the framework of ISO 22301 from a business continuity perspective, and continuity, availability, security, and privacy are so intrinsically linked, I think there's a lot that we can do with that framework. And I love, um, I, oh, is it IRAM 2, so the ISS framework, the Information Risk Assessment Methodology, actually contextualizing actor motivations, sensitivity of information, then efficacy of controls. And although GDPR doesn't talk about it, for me, I find there's a, a kind of direct alignment with those that, that, that kind of works really well. Um, don't worry, a couple more slides. Um, Article 32 compliance, these are kind of some key areas that I think 
are incredibly important from a, from a GDPR perspective. So logging, and this becomes, in my experience, a lot more challenging as we move to kind of this mobile cloud first world of having that kind of single repository of organizational telemetry. It's a long sentence, I know, but ha having that available. So some form of security analytics platform so that when you are in a situation of there being a breach, you have kind of one or two places to go rather than 50 or 60 that I showed before. Access control, and we spoke about access control previously. I think you know, you've seen in the press some kind of, I suppose, faux pas in the access control space with misconfigured Amazon S3 buckets and things like that over the last few years. Having that principle of least privilege where possible, being able to evidence, that's a pretty clear one for me around data protection by design. Only allowing people access to it. Yes, it's done something like that. That's why you mentioned it. Yeah. Because I basically got thrown out of the bank a few months ago because they said that all their information was central AWS R5 and Frank Frankfurt with no partitioning, no nothing. So uh, it was a bit frightening actually. I'm glad I wasn't with that bank myself. But yeah. Um, is, that, is that a common thing with Amazon in your experience where they just don't do any partitioning or anything? I'm being recorded. Uh, no. <laughs> No, in, in, no, in fact, all those S3 bucket failures, you know, some number of words, failures have actually driven, have they not, Amazon to change the default config of um, all of their um, resource zones in, in every country, that now by default they would have that principle. So it's a bit late if you have your details within that bank, but I think, you know, the controls, and again, I can speak about AWS. AWS was the analysis I did for my thesis. So the controls exist. <laughs> And an important point to remember with any cloud provider, and, and Amazon actually wrote this phrase, was they're responsible for the security of the cloud. So the data centers, the network cables, the, the lighting, the door passes. But invariably, you're responsible for security in the cloud. So, you know, migrating all your workloads to, I don't know, Azure or having your code running in Lambda, for example, you're still responsible. You're still the data owner in that scenario if it's going to AWS. So make sure you have those controls. Should by default there have been least privilege on S3 buckets since they were implemented? Possibly, yeah. But um, I, I add one more to that as well. Do not see off these days. Honey pots or deception? Yeah, that, that is the biggest plan for the block amongst all of those things. Yeah, I was going to ask where and there are the are the systems to actually detect a breach? Yeah, uh, I mean, deception is, is definitely one of the things you can do. I uh, agree. I mean. For me, detect a breach would be kind of all of these. I ask a bit of a cop out answer, but in all seriousness, I do like some of the honeypotting kind of capabilities that I'm seeing out there from some of those vendors. As long as you're taking the output of those and feeding those into whatever your security lifecycle is, because I see a lot of people do it, they have it, they will look great, they will look like games consoles when you're You can spend millions of volumes. Yeah. You can spend thousands of honeypotting. Yeah. And you can build within minutes or time. Um, I, I, again, I'd love to discuss that much. Y yes, I, I think that today it forms a level of security assurance and response completely. Do I think a honeypot is a core capability for protecting personal information? I think it would be incredibly useful in identifying relevant threat actors and identifying vulnerabilities in your in your network. Um, would I have it as a core set of capabilities here? Possibly. I mean, maybe I'd put that somewhere here. But I, I agree. And, and now actually I'm seeing more people move away from, you've kind of got this evolution of pen testing as well, where people are moving from pen testing to red teaming and now it's kind of a variation of honeypotting where they're looking kind of active response based on different scenarios where you would feed your endpoint WannaCry in a kind of XML schema based response and say, what happens <coughs> if I try and run this on my network? So it's kind of the endpoint level of honeypotting. But I agree, for, bang for buck, yeah I think they're great. Uh, yeah, I'm just gonna gonna wrap up on a couple of points here. So again, this was the piece I wrote around 20% of GDPR being within my purview. Considerations for GDPR that I have: this concept of state of the art, you know, references to state of the art security. Again, I I struggle with what that means. Again, honeypotting clearly would be state of the art. Um, my interpretation of it as a as a CISO in a tech organisation, probably very different to a security manager in. It doesn't matter which industry, but there are, there are variations in shades of grey. Privacy by design, I, I, I do, I agree with Nigel's points from earlier that it's a lot more than technology. It is about business process, it is about culture, it is about everything from your contracts to the way that you let people into your building. 
but understanding it from a technical perspective and articulating it to, for example, gentleman's point from earlier, developers, incredibly high, incredibly high risk proposition. 72 hour reporting, I'm just going to wait and see what happens on that. To be perfectly honest, I think there's going to be some, some challenges in that space. And the never ending battle with encryption, I think, as well, um, it's kind of one of my final points is it's almost this double edged sword, isn't it? You know, no one will argue the benefits of confidentiality and integrity to you know, oppress regimes or organisations with sensitive information and needing to transmit things securely. <coughs> but as a, as a CISO, you know, in the security context, if you're not decrypting that encrypted traffic, it's incredibly hard to do any of the stuff we talked about today, honeypotting, logging, identification of malware. So it's a tough conversation that I think CISOs and maybe DPOs need to be having as well around explaining to your businesses, your legal teams, maybe your unions, depending which organization you're working in, as to why, and it's almost paradoxical to GDPR and privacy, but why you need to be inspecting encrypted traffic to be able to apply security and in that way kind of apply privacy as well. Uh, a couple of shameless plugs, I'm going to get off stage. Just some bits and bobs I did recently around, um, similar to this, kind of a Q&A around the role of the CISO in GDPR that I did with, with Cordery, a legal firm. Um, a lot of stuff on our website that I've been writing at the moment around how and where cloud-based service providers should be applying controls. And my final slide is what we do. I've talked about Zscaler, but having that kind of core set of security capabilities that you used to have in your data center so we're not honeypotting, I must, I must admit, but having that core set of everything from antivirus through to a sandboxing platform, through to DLP and logging, rather than having these 28 hops to the internet and multiple solutions, having that capability in one place, so as I unfortunately do fairly regularly, I was in Barcelona the day before yesterday, here today, off to San Francisco Saturday for RSA, having a local point of presence for my security controls locally is certainly a a lot faster and, and dare I say a lot more secure across all your devices. So then my LinkedIn details, and that's me. Done. Thank you very much. Sorry, Chris, you need to raise any questions maybe. Oh, I seem to be doing a paragraph. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, no. Is there any question for Chris uh, now? Because we will have after lunch a uh, discussion and if you come up with your questions about around your organizations, that would be interesting. Any question? No? So we will break for lunch now. In our conference program, uh, we, um, the panel starts quarter to two. So if you're happy we bring in now earlier, as we uh, finish early, is that okay? Half one, we start half one. Is everyone okay with half one? Mm -hmm. well, okay. Thanks. So we see everyone half one. Lunch is ready. Yes. And I'll uh, see you half one in here. Thank you. Thank you.